The case for American nationalism is self-evident. The United States is the most diverse country on earth. If we of all societies in the world will not have a nation and its constitution, then we will have anarchy. If we will not have a nation and its constitution, we will have Hobbesian war, whether figuratively or literally. Or to turn the question around, what, after all, is the alternative to nationalism? Anti-nationalism? Antipathy toward one's fellow citizens because they are one's fellow citizens? Pathological aversion to one's own country? A narcissistic flight to group identities that treat everyone outside those identities as somehow un-American? <clears throat> the questions answer themselves. So let anxious pundits wring their hands about epistemological questions concerning what exactly a nation may be and whether it's worth defending. We refute them by kicking a rock. Our starting point today, and one thing that I think everyone in this otherwise diverse crowd can agree upon, is the need for what we might call anti-anti-nationalism. It's the understanding that anti-nationalism is a utopian fantasy, that it shortchanges citizens, that it is something to be opposed. Yet anti-anti-nationalism, although critical, is not enough. It must be channeled through an informed sense of something else, that quaint but critically important phrase, the national interest. For too long, this phrase has been used in a parochial sense to refer to quasi-scholastic insider debates over foreign policy. I suggest that we adopt that phrase, the national interest, in a far more expansive sense to mean the well-being of our country as a whole. What is in the national interest within our country's borders as opposed to beyond them? That's the question I would like to address. For quite a while now, the default answer on the domestic front has been laissez-faire social and economic arrangements. The results, as a growing number of conservative thinkers now argue, have included severe social stratification and the disengagement of many better off Americans from the common good. The new thinking might be summarized as follows. Libertarianism, straight up, is like moonshine. If your health is otherwise good, you'll experience it as a tonic. But if anything about you is <clears throat> impaired, it could hurt or even kill you. And that is exactly why libertarianism alone cannot be trusted to guide nationalism, because it regards citizens who can't handle the moonshine as so much acceptable collateral damage. Libertarianism straight up has resulted at times in something inimical to the national interest, which by definition should have the greater good of all citizens in mind. Libertarianism, straight up, has given rise to a creed of so what. The creed of so what goes like this. So what if working class Americans can't find jobs? So what if people are crossing the border illegally and endangering themselves, sometimes dying in the process? So what if flyover country is plagued by drugs, health problems, even a drop in life expectancy? So what if people outside the coastal classes don't want biological boys in girls' bathrooms or on their daughters' sports teams? And so what if parents around the country also don't want their kids instructed in sexual revolution theology in the public schools but don't have the money to send them elsewhere? I would like to propose a countercultural alternative to the creed of so what. American nationalism needs to be tempered and guided by something other than straight-up libertarianism, something that does have a sense of the common good, a vision of the horizon beyond the self. What is vital to nationalism going forward 
is tradition-minded conservatism. Traditional conservatism, I hear the pain. <laughs> that unwanted artifact from the culture wars, that thing on the wrong side of history, reminding us of something that we drank deeply of libertarianism to forget, namely the unwanted social issues, Yes, that conservatism is exactly what I mean. Not its caricature at the hands of Hollywood and Twitter and Silicon Valley. Not its reduction to specific past controversies. We all know which ones. I am arguing here to recover something deeper that has always been a critical current of American history. The habit of mind that looks for wisdom not only to Adam Smith and the Austrian economists, but beyond them, to the American founders, to Athens and Jerusalem, to ancient and medieval philosophy and the Christian intellectual tradition, to the glories as well as the ills of American history, including military history, and to the riches of American arts and letters that are not found in standard issue anti-American history books. Any nationalism unmoored from such a mindful conservatism will sooner or later go adrift. That's because traditional conservatism and only traditional conservatism can give nationalism the ballast that it needs and can't find elsewhere. Memory, humility, discernment, gravitas. The creed of so what lacks all of these assets. It has no answer to identity politics, for example, because it too is rooted in the same solipsism obsession with the atomized self. And that's only one example of how straight up libertarian is insufficient to the national problems we face. Here are four more. First, as a flood of books and lawsuits is now making plain, one of the greatest tragedies in American history has been unfolding right under the nose of the so what creed during the past two decades. No nationalism worth the name and no future conservatism worth the name can fail to take account of this crisis. By the CDC's estimate, over 400,000 fellow Americans have perished in the opioid and heroin catastrophe that began in the early 1990s when pressure from drug companies on weak regulatory edifices resulted in rampant addiction and related catastrophic maladies. That estimate of the dead is only for 1999 to 2017. The actual number is obviously higher. Some estimates reach into 700,000. It would take Sophocles to deliver the full measure of this devastation. We don't have a Sophocles, but we can do arithmetic. One signal disaster of American history occurred in 1899 in Johnstown, Pennsylvania when the South Fork Dam collapsed and some 2,200 people lost their lives. Even by the CDC's more conservative estimate, the opioid and heroin epidemic amounts to 181 Johnstown floods. Another American tragedy was the 1900 hurricane in Galveston, Texas, until then the worst natural disaster in American history. The opioid crisis amounts to 50 Galveston hurricanes. And if those examples seem far too distant to matter, the same crisis also amounts to this, 133 9-11s. Armchair social Darwinists might shrug at these numbers. They shouldn't. Leaving aside the human devastation, the impact on the national bottom line is prodigious and growing. Just five days ago, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, called the economic impact of the crisis substantial, adding that it weighs on labor force participation, especially for younger men and women. It's a national crisis, he observed. And in this unique hell, the necessity of a national conservatism grounded in something other than rote libertarianism becomes clear. Who were the first responders to this scene besides a handful of courageous and dissenting doctors and journalists and parents? Not the progressive Obama administration. It was too busy deploring the guns and religion of the afflicted populations. 
including guns that some people bought to protect them from a crisis that no one in national authority seemed to care about. Progressives at large didn't notice because the victims did not hail from an improved victim class, because their deaths contradicted the left's racialist insistence on white privilege, and because Hollywood has long made rural folk and trailer parks into laughingstocks of the first resort. Neither did card-carrying libertarians race to the scene of American carnage, far from it. Throughout the crisis and into today, some have argued that the problem is not too many opioids in circulation, but too few. So in the case of the opioid crisis, in other words, the dominant creed of so what failed spectacularly. Every line of cultural authority turned out to be a Maginot line. From corporate executives who pushed out the most addictive substances known to man as if they were gummy bears, to certain doctors who should have known better, to weak regulators entranced by revolving doors. The list goes on. And at the same time, the record shows that tradition-minded conservatives did not ignore this crisis. You can see this in the back pages of magazines like First Things and the American Conservative, and elsewhere, though not only there. And the fact that some were paying attention, that they questioned the creedal, so what? underlines again the need for a nationalism, nationalism where such conservatism has a seat. The creed of so what seems to write off 400,000 dead people and their families as so much acceptable collateral damage. National conservatism of the future should say that 400,000 Americans are never again to be considered acceptable collateral damage. And in order to have the language it needs to speak that truth, national conservatism must be sustained by a conservatism more substantial than laissez-faire moonshine. This brings us to a second example of how the creed of so what needs to be countered by a deeper understanding of the national interest. Social conservatives and only social conservatives have been calling attention for many years now to a problem that others profess to see. That is the sexual disorder that disfigures the public square, a disorder that is also inimical to the national interest. Once upon a time, people who didn't want to be part of that disfiguration could opt out. Today, thanks to the increasingly hysterical demands of a progressivism enthralled to the sexual revolution, that option is no more. Nationalism, we have a problem here. Let me mention just one example. The flight from biological science, the unhinged insistence overruled by any DNA test that there is no such thing as male or female, is increasingly written into regulations and law. It is exacting real consequences that no one even a few years ago saw coming. Employment penalties, the invasion of biological males into traditionally female spaces, and an immense pressure for social conformity and forced participation in collective delusion. Thank you. This race away from empiricism and the social coercion it entails are dangerous for self-government. If even the most obvious scientific facts are in public dispute, and if citizens can be punished for speaking the truth, how are we to adjudicate any other questions in public life? The creed of so what has nothing to say about this traducing of reality and its harmful consequences. But across the country, many millions of citizens do care. Their voices deserve to be heard. Their apprehensions need to be understood. And here again, tradition-minded conservatism listens and learns where others do not. Here, a note about social class demands sounding. Rich people can evade some of the social chaos out there by sending their children to elite religious and other schools. Well-organized and exceptionally self-sacrificing parents can evade the chaos by homeschooling. But what about all the poorer or less fortunate 
children who make up the great majority of our public schools. Those kids and those schools have become social experiments on the front lines of sexual revolution theology. Surely somebody ought to stand up for them. <clears throat> Third, contrary to the creed of so what that's been dominant in all the better places since the Moynihan Report, Tradition-minded conservatives have also been right to insist that it's in the national interest to promote and help the building blocks of civilization itself, i.e. families. The liberal left and the rest of hashtag so what have been looking the other way for decades now about the problems of kinship implosion. These are well documented by generations of perfectly secular social science. Microcosmic breakdown of the family across the Western world is having macrocosmic social and economic consequences. From massive immigration, in, from massive migration into Europe, which was undertaken in the name of demographic implosion, <clears throat> to the financial clouds now looming over every Western welfare state. The problem for small government conservatives is this. There is no reigning in the growth of the state without first reigning in some of the behaviors that have served as accelerants. The expanded modern state and the imploding modern family can't be understood apart from one another. The state bankrolls the fatherless home and attendant complications, and the fatherless home and attendant complications fuel the growth of government. A creed of so what that prizes individual autonomy over the public good again has ignored an obvious fact that has a lot to do with social well-being. Fourth, in speaking of the Moynihan Report, one final reason why tradition-minded conservatism is an essential part of the national conversation to come. This one is less visible but vital, and it concerns America's original sin. Tradition-minded conservatism dominated as it is by religious Christians and Jews, is this country's strongest asset against resurgent racism. Religious history is long and tarnished with transgressions, but anti-religious prejudice can never write out of American history some salient facts. They include the religious roots of abolitionism, the presence of Catholic and other clergy on the front lines of the civil rights movement, the fact that generations of poor children, in the inner city especially, have been lifted into a better life thanks to education in Catholic schools, and many other examples. Martin Luther King Jr. cannot be understood apart from his magnificent role in exactly this tradition of American religiosity. Up to and including today, it's the churches that have been the go-to of first resort for American blacks, Hispanics, and other minority groups their deepest needs can never be met by either a paternalistic welfare state or an indifferent so whatism, and neither can anybody else's. What does it tell us that the minuscule but real phenomenon of white nationalism is pro-abortion, racialist, and despises Christianity? It tells us that tradition-minded conservatism the sworn enemy of every element of that program has gotten something big right. And it tells us that progressivism's efforts to shut down Christian charities, Christian schools, and Christian expression are all subversive of the national interest. Thank you. To summarize and in closing, we live in a nation whose leftists and liberals increasingly regard many of their own fellow citizens as malignant. Hostility toward the hinterland echoed through the rhetoric of former President Obama and Hillary Clinton and other leaders of the liberal left. The newest round of progressives goes even further. Not only do they lack empathy and understanding of people who are different, they are also ever more detached from reality itself in ways that can only be described as clinically interesting. <laughs> what do these pathologies of the liberal left tell us? They tell us that American conservatism, 
whatever its flaws and varieties, is now the only political movement where free and independent thinking about the country's future can be found. This conference is both an embodiment of that truth and it's to be hoped, a step forward toward a nation that can someday be healed of furious solipsisms, whether the increasingly panicked descent into identity politics or the insufficient creed of so what. Left liberalism can't attend to these wounds. Hashtag so what can't either. It will take a deeper conservative tradition to show solidarity with all citizens, a solidarity that tomorrow's nationalism must share if it is to further the national interests. Thank you very much. Thank you.